Y'all know the song. Wonderful Jesus, you are Savior, you are Lord, and you are God. Come on, y'all, help me sing.
everybody get up on their feet and praise the Lord with us. you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're giving you a Beulah hug. We're so glad that you've taken the time to be with us during this worship experience. God is an awesome God, and he has a powerful word for each and every one of us. Please take one moment just to share this broadcast. Somebody, everybody needs to hear what God has for them this morning. Amen? Hallelujah. Psalms 108 says this, it says, oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. Awake sultry and harp, I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people and I will sing praises unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great above the heavens and thy truth reacheth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and thy glory above all the earth. Come on, let's pray together. Father God, be thou exalted, God. You are a God who is worthy of all of our exaltation, Lord God. You're worthy of the praise. You're worthy of the glory and the honor, God. So we welcome you, God. Bow down your presence into this place, Father God. Move, Lord God, across the airwaves, Lord God. Have your way, God. Minister to our spirit, man, Lord God. But first, please forgive us of our sins. Prepare the table of our hearts, Lord God. We desire, Lord God, to dine in the beauty of your presence, Lord God. We want to receive everything that you have for us right now, God. Oh God, we love you. Oh God, we honor you. Oh God, we bless your name, Lord God, and we desire you, Lord God. You above all things, Lord God, the lover of our souls, God. Thank you, Lord God. We rejoice in you, Lord. We thank you for the word that you've sent forth through your manservant, Lord God. Anoint him afresh, Lord God, and let the word that you've sent forth, Lord God, let it minister directly to our spirit, man. Let it change us and let us walk uprightly before you. Let it be written on our hearts, Lord God. Father, we love you, but you love us best, Lord God, and so we will give you the glory and the honor that's due your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, say amen. 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 Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you have always been an ever-present help, God. You have always been our shield. You've always been our buckler. 
You've always lifted us up, Lord God, in every situation. Lord God, it's been you. Hallelujah. It's you, God. Glory to God. It's you. God, it's you. And we thank you, Lord God, for how you keep us, Lord God, how you sustain us. You never let us go, Lord God. We thank you for your shield and your protection. Lord, how they increase that trouble me. Many there be that rise up against me. Many there be which say my soul. There is no help for her and I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy heat. I lay me down and I slept. I awaked for the Lord sustained me. strong in the Lord. Listen. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that set themselves against me round about. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that set themselves against me round about.
are on our way to Freedom Plaza and we are so excited to be a part of this event. It means so much to us. And when we got there, guys, there were so many people there in support, either surviving or currently battling some form of breast cancer. It was amazing to see so many people in good spirits. And we met some great people along the way that didn't mind taking a few photos with us. He's there with me. It was so awesome to see how many people showed up for themselves and other people. The walk is about to begin. But first, a few stories were shared about those who had survived. And before we knew it, that three mile walk was over. But we made it and so did everybody else. And we were so grateful for that experience. It is one we won't ever forget. So continue to keep the faith and walk by it. Thanks for watching. a day and um, the only after effects I had with it was I felt tired all the time. I sat down, I fall off to sleep and if I was talking to you I couldn't finish the conversation <laughs> because I said, Miss Hunter, you, you ran out of words, oh yeah, I'm like, okay, I, what was I saying? And But I am truly blessed and honored and favored because God has blessed me to 
be well enough to be a caregiver for my daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, she has struggled so much, but God has kept me here for 88 years. I'll be 89 in December to take care of her. And I just thankful and praise God every breath I take. I just praise and honor him because it ha didn't have to be, you know. I live a, a, alone personally, but I know God is here with me. And uh, I'm able to take care of myself. I don't need uh, anyone to come in and do anything. Although my sons, they keep the house clean and all like that. And so I'm just trying. First of all, I would make sure I had the right doctors and not give into it, you know, because I have a saying that I always say that when they diagnose me for diabetes, Miss Hunter, you have diabetes. I said, diabetes may have me, but I may have diabetes, but diabetes doesn't have me. And you have to have a positive outlook on things. Don't think of this as a death sentence or, oh my, you know, what am I going to do? Just think constantly, trust in the Lord, give it to Him. Because I don't care how many treatments you get or what other people do, only God has the power to say so, you know. So I would say, just keep pressing on and trusting and believing and always say, this too shall pass. Because he already knows what the end will be, you know, so. Amen. Any other questions, Brooke? I think we are good. I just appreciate you sharing your story with us. Yes. Time for us. But we thank you for graciously telling your story. We love you and we thank God for you. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Alma Branham, and I was diagnosed on April the 9th of 2021 uh, with uh, invasive uh, left breast carcinoma. And I'm a one year and four months breast cancer survivor. And my birthday was April the 5th, and I turned 70. On April the 5th, what happened, uh, a little background, my mother passed 20. And then on April the 3rd, suddenly I'd lost my brother. And two days before my birthday, uh, uh, his, he died April the 3rd, 2021. And my birthday was April the 5th, 2021. And I was diagnosed with uh, carcinoma of the left breast on April the 9th of that same year. And my best girlfriend caught COVID and she subsequently died on April the 20th. In the midst of COVID-19, uh, I, I think I began to realize or recognize how Job must have felt. 
I didn't cry. Uh, I was just really like in a state of shock. Mm -hmm. And the death of my, I kept thinking of just about the death of my brother dying suddenly. And when they gave me the diagnosis, you know, I looked at the, you know, the, the, the physician and I so she said, do you understand? I said, I do. And she began to explain what would have to, you know, the options of treatment. And I told her, I said, excuse me, I hear you, but I can't do anything until I bury my brother. You know, yeah. that's just where I am right now. I have to bury my brother. And she looked at me and she said, uh, uh, but you can't wait too long. I said, no, I will not wait. But after I bury my brother, I'll be back. And wow. so I went home and I began to pray and uh, fervently, I thought. And I kept asking the Lord, you know, I said, Lord, you know, my mother's passed. Now, my, bro my father had already died 28 years before. My mom has passed. Now my brother's passed. I'm in COVID-19. My best friend is terminally ill. And now I've lost my health. And I said, Lord, if there's any way of this cup, just like Jesus said, could pass me by. And the Lord said, no. And I'm thinking, no. Well, wait a minute. Let me, let me pray again. So I prayed that same prayer three times. And each time I could hear his voice and Jesus told me no. But he also told me, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I said, Lord, I don't mind dying because I know I'm going to have everlasting life. I just don't want to be sick. Right. And he said, you know, I promise you, you're not going to be that sick. You're going to be okay. So what I did, what, what my usual thing is when I get stressed out, I went to bed, curled up in a fetal position. And other than, you know, getting up with the necessities, I went back to bed, laid in fetal position for three days. And on that third day, I decided, you know, I want to live. I'm going to do what has to be done. The Lord said he's going to take care of me, and I'm going to stand on that. And so what I did, I called, um, you know, I think, made the arrangements and whatnot, and buried my brother. I didn't tell anybody about it until I buried him, and I called everybody. I called the church. I called Buell. I called Pastor Turner. I called Reese Thomas, who's a, the facilitator for the missionaries, Fern Johnson, uh, the facilitator for the recycled teenagers. Uh, let's see. I called every prayer warrior I knew, and I told them that I would like for them to pray for me, call out my name at the throne of grace, and petition the Lord on my behalf, because I believe that prayer would carry me through. You know, so then I had to have the surgery. I had to go to the doctors or whatever. And they, they, I had an MRI of the, they needed an MRI of the breast, which I'd never heard had one. I read up on it. It was terrifying because it's a loud boom noise. But I kept repeating Psalms 27, one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And, um, I have to see the on cancer free now. I have to see the oncologist and the breast surgeon every six months. But prior to going, I always had the prayer warriors of Beulah Baptist Church praying for me. And the outcome has been very good. I, if, uh, I never thought, I thought after the loss of my family, my immediate family, that I'd ever be happy again. I'm I can't, I would never believe I'd be as happy as I am today. And I contribute that, uh, it's not a crusade, to God first, my family, and the Beulah Baptist Church Ministries. I was so happy when you all, we had last Sunday, I did attend in person, Ministry Appreciation Day. And uh, because it was those ministries that held me up. And I, I do uh, thank God for all I went through. He, he never lied. He never forsake me. He never forsook me. And every ministry that I was in, 
I didn't want for money. I didn't want for food. I didn't want for transportation. The Lord provided everything seamlessly. Uh, the members of Beulah, uh, the covenant members and friends of Beulah stuck with me every step of the way uh, during the loss of my mother, my brother, my friend, my health, and are still with me today. And I would never have made it without the grace of God and all those people, Beulah included, um, helping me through this journey. And I was discovered, it was just a, a, a yearly mammogram. I didn't feel any lumps, any of that. And she saw two tiny, small spots on the mammogram. And once they biopsied the spots, those two spots turned out to be stage one cancer. You know, I, I, I even give myself, okay, look, you can be down today, but tomorrow you're up, girl. <laughs> Focus on your faith and the fight that you have to go through and not that fear. Because that fear will stop you in your tracks. You won't do anything. I believe that because of times when I just focus on my problems or my circumstance, you know, I can kind of, you know, get kind of down and depressed and you, you, you won't move forward. But if you start helping or encouraging somebody else, that encourages you. And someone sent me a song, I forgot the name of the artist, but it was a, uh, Never Will I Be Defeated. And I play that over and over. And even now, sometimes you may get a little down or sad, you know, about your losses. And then I to, look, I play those songs and I think about what I've gained. Well, I always felt, I was one of these people, I always felt I was in control. And that was an illusion, but I didn't find out that was really an illusion until after my breast cancer journey. I never was in control. God was always in control. And since, um, you know, sometimes I, I would come to church and I would come to Bible study, hit and missing, depending on my work schedule. I'd be in some of our class, Bible Institute, some of the classes. But, you know, I think I used to play like lip service where, you know, the Lord will never leave me nor forsake me. Now I know that is true because I have witnessed it. I've experienced it. And now every text message or chat group that I'm on, I always give a word from the Lord because that's the thing that's, that's the only thing that will sustain us. And, um, you know, like, and if I say, I see a change in you, you know, I always thought I was a good person, but I really wasn't all that like I thought I was. And the more I studied the word, I realized, you know, doing this whole journey, uh, the Lord kind of set me down. I had time to study the word because I wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> and and now that I, the more I study his word, the more I trust him. And I feel like David, I fought the lion and the bear so I can do anything with God. Is that enough? <laughs> Um, we appreciate you. We thank you for your time, just being a part, and just even being open to be recorded, um, trusting us with your story. We want to thank you in reference to just making time for us. Yeah, and I, I appreciate it, and I'm so grateful that uh, the two of you asked me. So my son said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to tell my story. So the sun is coming up in the morning, and the moon is coming up at night, and we have a choice whether or not we want to participate. <laughs> You accept God, you are in full control of my life. God, you told me that all things work together for my good. God, you told me that you got me here. I'm not here because of no mistake. I'm not here because of no something that's happened. I'm here because God, you in full control. And if you have me here, you can work with my life. Somebody said, if you bring me to it, what? what?
restores my failing And it helps me do what honors him the most That's why I'm saying Thank God I'm saying I'm saying I'm saying
praise God. We praise God. We praise God for today. This is the day the Lord has made, and we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. To those of you who are watching on our website and other social media platforms, I pray that you have been blessed thus far by the broadcast. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 20. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. May God add a blessing to his already blessed word. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Now, wise eternal Father, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this moment. Lord, I thank you for another preaching and teaching opportunity. So, Lord, I need you to remove me from self and fill me with your spirit. Give me the words to say and the things to do. Lord, I pray that you would allow me to decrease so that you might increase. Forgive me of my sins, Lord. Look beyond my faults and see this your people's need. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for survival. So, Lord, we'll be so careful to give your name the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, let the church of the Lord say, Amen. Hallelujah. To God's name be the glory. Beulah, this year we're living, and we're living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And if you're going to do that, you must be living in the face of bad news. You have to learn how to live in the face of bad news news. Let me say it one more time for the Holy Ghost. You must learn how to live in the face of bad news. That's not the time for you to fall out. That's not the time for you to give up. That's not the time for you to turn around and quit. That's the time for you to live instead of dying. Bad news, we all know what bad news is. No doubt all of us at one time or another have received some bad news. Bad news is unwelcome news. Bad news is disappointing news. Bad news is unexpected news. Bad news is devastating news. Bad news is troublesome news. And you know, it's funny because the newspaper and the television broadcasts are all filled with what? Bad news. All you hear is about disaster, corruption, and incompetence. And no one, no matter who you are, is immune from bad news. You're not immune from having disappointments in your life. The Bible says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials that come your way. The Bible says it is common unto man. Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. So when you get to a point where you receive bad news, you got to get to a point where you learn how to process that information. You have to learn how to deal with the bad news. You have to learn how to move on with your life unscathed. You have to learn how to face bad news anyhow. And that's what this story is about. 
This story is about a man that received what I can consider some of the worst news possible. However, he lived through it in the face of bad news. It's funny because in the previous chapter, uh, the king Hezekiah, they had a great, a great victory. Uh, they was delivered and, uh, from the Assyrian threat. They were delivered. And you would think that all was going well, but in that very next chapter, it says Hezekiah became terribly sick, sick unto death. Can you imagine being on your highest mountain today and then finding out that you're sick unto death tomorrow? Can you imagine celebrating your, your 20th, your 30th, your 50th, your 60th wedding anniversary and then finding out that you're sick unto death? Can you imagine going through life thinking you just celebrated the greatest victory only the next moment to receive what one would consider the greatest defeat. And here it is, Hezekiah is sick, terribly ill, and God sends the prophet Isaiah to his house with a message. And the message was to tell the king that uh, he needed to put his affairs in order because he was going to die soon. Imagine that, getting the news. Somebody knows about that type of bad news. Somebody knows about that type of hurt. When you get the news that the very child that you've been carrying is not going to live. You get the news that the very job that you've dedicated your life to and you've been working on is no longer available to you. You go to the doctor and the doctor diagnosed you with something that's been there, but there was no symptoms. There was no way you could have known and prevented what is there now, and you only have a few months to live. When you receive bad news, when you get a phone call in the middle of the night and they tell you that one of your children or grandchildren has been in an accident, uh, they tell you that uh, somebody has been robbed, raped, or mugged. Bad news. And that's what Hezekiah received. He was already sick. He was already not feeling well, but at the same time, he got a word from the Lord. Whenever a prophet showed up, I believe that they, there was more respect for prophets there was more respect for messengers of God during the biblical days. So when a show sure enough authentic prophet showed up, you understood that you was hearing from God. There was no doubt. There was no uh, possibility. You understood what you were about to hear was from the Lord. Just like when the angels showed up. Nobody uh, second guessed the angels. When the angel showed up to Mary, she knew that she was hearing from the Lord. And the man of God showed up and he looked at Hezekiah in his face and imagine hearing these words, set your house in order because you're not going to live. You're going to die. Devastating news. Disappointing news. And I tell you, it's something that we all can relate to. Maybe it's not news of death, but it's news of disappointment. It's news of discouragement. It's news of despair. All of us can relate to getting some news that we would rather not hear. But it's amazing because in the midst of getting that terrible news, Bula Nation, I want you to look at Hezekiah's response to the bad news. When I read the first three verses, I could have read several other verses that talks about his healing and other things, but it's in these three verses that blew me away. It's, it's his response. It's his, uh, the way he reacts to the bad news that catches my attention. Uh, because when you look in the word of God, Romans 15, 4 says that everything that was written the fourth time was written for our learning. 
was written so that we might have hope. And it's here that if you look at this text and see the way Hezekiah responded and how God responded to his response, that ought to give you hope. God was pleased at the way Hezekiah responded. And because he was pleased at the way Hezekiah responded, he responded in a miraculous way. Yeah, I tell you, when you respond right, God responds right. When you respond in faith, when you respond with knowledge that not God knows what he is doing, God will show up on your behalf. When you get to verse 4, I've jumped past 1 to 3 for a moment. In verse 4, it says God had compassion. God showed up. He was moved immediately. Isaiah hadn't even got across the courtyard yet. Isaiah hadn't been gone any time, and already God was speaking to Isaiah saying, I need you to go back in and talk to Hezekiah again. I can only imagine Isaiah said, Lord, I've already given the, the report. I've already given the message you asked me to give. But God says, no, I have a second message. I want you to go back in and, and tell him I've heard his prayer. Go back in and tell him I've seen his brokenness. Go back in and tell him that I'm going to heal his body. Matter of fact, you know the story. If not, God added 15 more years to the life of Hezekiah. <laughs> he was about to die. It was clear, and God told him to get his house in order. He was going to die, but something happened to cause him to move God. And when anytime I'm reading in the Bible and I find somebody that has moved God, Somebody that has changed the way God looks at something. I need to follow what they did. I need to study what they did. And that's why I'm always looking at that woman with the issue of blood. All those people was around Jesus. All the multitude was pushing and thronging and grabbing on him so much that the disciples thought he was losing his mind when he said, somebody touch me. He said, Lord, look at all of these people. Why are you talking like that? He said, you don't understand. Somebody touch me and virtue yes. left my body. I, I got to study her because I, I got to know what she knew. I got to get what she had because when I touch the Lord, I, I want him to stop in his tracks. When I touch the Lord, I want to drain virtue from him. When I touch the Lord, I want to get his attention. I don't want to be like everybody else. That they say they touching him, but they, he don't show up. No, I need God to show up my God. on my behalf. Yes, That's what he did to Hezekiah. He, he showed up, giving him 15 more years. If he was 60, he had to 75. If he was 75, he had to 90. If he was 90, he had 105. God blessed him in the mighty name of Jesus. What was it about it? I'll tell you what, what it was. Hezekiah knew how to live in the face of bad news. Hezekiah knew how to survive. Hezekiah knew how to take a, a hit. Hezekiah knew how to take a bad report. He understood life was not always going to be easy. In Proverbs chapter 3, it says, do not be afraid of sudden terror. That's what we got to get to, guys. Bill and Nation, you got to get there. You have to get to a point where you're not afraid of sudden terror. Yeah, yeah, I, I want you to know it's going to come. You're going to have some ups and downs. You're going to have some disappointments. But when it shows up, don't you be afraid. You hold your head up and you remember that your God is in full control. You remember that earth has no sorrows, that heaven cannot heal. Do not be afraid of sudden terror. i tell you why. Because the Bible also says in Proverbs 24 that if you are afraid, 
It says if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. And I don't want that to be my testimony. I don't want that to be what you know me by. No, I want you to know that I'm large. I want you to know that I'm in charge. I want you to know that I have the strength to stand on God's word. God has been good to me and I trust him. I want to say what grandmama said, I will trust him until I die. Yeah, you got to learn how to live in the face of bad news. Yeah, you must accept how to live that way. Uh, we got to accept that there's going to be times of bad news, and you better learn how to respond like Hezekiah did. Well, Pastor, how did he respond? Let me give you the first lesson. He turned his face to the wall. And if you're going to live in the face of bad news, you better learn to turn your face to the wall. There's about four things that happens when you turn your face to the wall. Just imagine he was there with Isaiah right there in front of him. And the wall, no doubt, was behind them. And soon as he received the news, the Bible doesn't go anywhere except from verse 1 to verse 2 to verse 3. And soon as he received the news, the Bible says he turned his face towards the wall. In other words, he cut off communication. See, that's your issue. You got to talk to everybody. You got to stay on the phone. You have to be in conversation with family members and friends. You got to talk to colleagues and, and, and classmates and coworkers about everything that's going on in your life. But when you receive bad news, if you're going to survive, you're going to have to cut off communication. Yeah, yeah, that's why when I go on my sabbaticals and when I go places, I, I leave my phone at the house. Don't want to hear from anybody. Don't call me. Don't text me. Don't Facebook me. Don't, don't Snapchat me. Don't get in touch with me in any way. I do not want to hear from you because when I turn my face to the wall, I got to cut off everything because I need some me time. You see, so many of us, we're so scared of me time, one, because I guess you're scared of what God may say to you when he gets you alone, or maybe you're so lonely and so, you know, your self-esteem is not there. You can't handle being by yourself. You always feel like since you had somebody with you, you can't tolerate yourself. You better learn how to have some me time. The Bible says Isaiah was literally standing there, and he turned his face. To the wall. Hezekiah looked the opposite way and he cut off communication. Isaiah, you've said, this is what he said by turning. Isaiah, you've said what you needed to say. Now I need to do something different. I need to have a discussion with my God. Something else that turning your face to the wall does, guys, it isolates others. Yeah, he had to just isolate Isaiah because uh, I don't know if the prophet caught the hint right away, if he understood what was next. He didn't know if he needed to give him a drink of water or catch him in his arms, so he stood there. But after a while, when Hezekiah turned, uh, he began to do what he needed to do, and Isaiah was standing there looking at Hezekiah's back. At that time, I can only imagine he bowed out. He just kind of waved his hand and he left out the room. And I know he left the room because in verse 4, it says he was making his way across the courtyard. So it's clear that he left. See, you got to give people a hint that it's time for them to leave. Yeah, some folks will stay at your house a tad too long. They'll stay in the sanctuary. They'll stay in the office. They'll stay in the car. Sometimes there's a hint. You have to learn how to isolate others. Because if you don't isolate others, there's no way you and God can get together. Sometimes when you turn your face to the wall, another thing I believe that it shows, he wanted to hide his emotion. He wanted to kind of just deal with God himself. And it's so important that you got to say, what you mean by hide your emotions? See, most of us, we wear our emotions and our feelings on our sleeves. We want everybody to know we're sad. We want everybody to know we're broken, we're busted, we're disgusted, we're hurt. 
You know, we can't wait for somebody to ask us how we doing so we can bust out in tears. No, that's something that me and God has to deal with. God told me I, don't, I shouldn't let other people see me sweat. God told me that I need to always know that I'm more than a conqueror through him. God told me that I'm victorious through him. Yeah, yeah, I don't have time to show my emotions. What he did was, as he was talking and Isaiah gave his prophecy, Hezekiah turned his face. And no doubt his face began to grimace and no doubt tears began to run down his eyes. No doubt he was aching in pain, but he didn't feel that it was needed to be seen by Isaiah. He felt that that was something between him and his God. And Beulah Nation, there's some things you got to just reserve between you and your God. I, I know we in an open society now, in a woke society, and we want to let everybody know everything, and we put everything out, but there's some stuff that a wife should reserve to a husband. There's some stuff that a woman should reserve to her future spouse. There's some stuff that a man should reserve to his wife. There's some stuff that a child of God should reserve to God himself. God expects you to hold yourself together. Uh, that's why when Jesus showed up to the, to the Pharisees, he said, stop being hypocritical. You show too much. He said, what you do in private is what gets rewarded, what? In public. He, God discouraged public everything. God likes private worship. God likes private blessing. He said, even when you bear your arms, he said, do it without spreading the news about everything. Nowadays, it has to be. I won't give unless I can put it on Facebook. Unless I can let everybody know and call the news channel and let them know this is what we're doing. This is what God is doing for me. But that's not how God operates. Something else I believe he turned his face to the wall because of the fact Isaiah had given Hezekiah a load. Isaiah had given Hezekiah a burden. Uh, just think about it. Here you are sick. You got all the high, the great wishes and the well wishes to want to get well. And the man of God comes and says, get your affairs in order. Yeah. You will die. And I believe he turned his face towards the wall to collect his thoughts. See, some of us, we react, but we don't collect our thoughts. Some of us, we, re we react, but we don't really put thought or wisdom to it. We give what most people call a knee-jerk responsibility, a response. And we got to watch out for that because of the fact sometimes what we give back is not of faith. Sometimes how we act is not of God. Sometimes how we carry ourselves is not a divine response. But that's not what Hezekiah did. He just turned his face towards the wall. And Beulah Nation, if you're going to live in the face of bad news, you better learn how to turn your face towards the wall. Second lesson that shows up right here is you got to learn how to talk to God about your situation. Can you see him? There he is, facing the wall. He wasn't even looking at Isaiah. We don't even know if Isaiah was in uh, the room any longer. And he sat there and he began to talk to God. We have a word that we, we call talking to God, and that is pray. See, prayer is our way of communicating with God. Just like a child talks and listens to his father, prayer is how we as children of God converse with our heavenly father. That's why the songwriter said, just a little talk with Jesus will make everything all right. And I tell you, Beulah, praying to God is simple. All you really must do is speak to him with a genuine heart. Yeah, yeah, the Bible says if you call upon the name of the Lord and come to him in prayer, God will listen to you. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
And you know, prayer is freely given to us by God. Prayer is a gift to us by God, and that's why we need to understand why it is so important. And that's why I believe that Hezekiah was able to live even in the face of his bad news because he knew how to talk to God. Some of us, we don't talk to God enough to really learn how to have a conversation with him. We usually have to start the conversation with God is me. I know we haven't talked in a good little while, but I really need you now. No, I don't want to talk to God like that. God, I'm calling you back up. I know I just spoke to you a little while ago, but something happened over the last hour that I need to talk to you about. See, you got to have a relationship with God. The more you talk to God, the more God knows what to do in your situation. You see, prayer allows you to grow closer to God. Prayer will align you with God's will. When you pray, you begin to understand what God's will is in a certain situation. Prayer removes the emphasis off of you and places it on him. And that's, what, that's, what, that's what Hezekiah did. When he turned his face towards the wall, he literally was just saying, God, I got you on my mind. I don't have nothing else on my mind. I'm not thinking about anything else. I have you on my mind. Prayer gives strength. Prayer gives hope. Prayer gives wisdom and guidance. And he began to talk to God. And I encourage you, Beulah Nation, to talk to God. Stop falling out. Stop losing your mind. Stop falling to pieces just because you hear something that's not pleasing to your ears. Life is not about hearing something pleasing all the time. Life is about surviving. Life is about making it. Life is about knowing that it's in him that we live, move, and have our being. And Hezekiah, he was right on target. First of all, he turned his face towards the wall, and then he began to talk to God. He began to share with God what was on his mind. And I believe that that's what we have to do, learn how to share with God. Lesson number three, put God in remembrance of his word. Yeah, one of the greatest components of Hezekiah's prayer was reminding God of some things. And see, let me, let me tell you, there's two parts to this. Because I'm about to tell you what he put God in remembrance of. But before you can put God in remembrance of something, you have to be true to what you're about to say. Yeah, yeah, you know, he talked about his behavior, he talked about his heart, and he talked about his walk. Now, if your behavior ain't worth nothing, and your heart is insincere, and if your walk is not even worth talking about, then you don't need to put God in remembrance of anything. See, you have to make sure that your life is being lived and you are sowing what you need to sow so when harvest comes, you can reap the harvest. And see, Hezekiah understood what he had sowed. Do you know what you're sowing? Do you really know what you're sowing? I know many of us, we have lied to so many people, even to ourselves, we have started to believe it. But do you know what you are sowing? Hezekiah knew what he was sowing, so when he turned his face towards the wall and he began to talk to God, he put God in remembrance. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. He said, God, let me put you in remembrance of some stuff. Let me talk to you. And I'm going to tell you why you have to put God in remembrance. Because God has a good pleasure about you. God wants to give you anything and everything his kingdom contains. The gospel of Luke says that. And you need to understand that prayer should be God looking down to earth and seeing a mirror reflecting his word back to him. When you pray to God, you ought to pray his word to him and remind him of what he has said. God, you said you'll make ways out of no way. God, you said you was a bridge over troubled water. God, you said that when my enemies come upon me to eat up my flesh, they're going to stumble 
and fall. See, see, in Isaiah chapter 43, it says something. What did it say? God says this, listen, put me in remembrance of what I said. That's what God said. God tells us to put him in remembrance of what he said. See, prayer shouldn't be about just reminding God of our problems. That's what we do. We just, we talk to God and we just go down to every problem and we complain the same way we talk to, to folks. But no, don't remind God of your problems. Remind the Lord of who he is and what he has declared to you. Remind him of his word. Oh, I tell you, man, we need to get to a point where we start praying about the problem and we pray about the solution. And the word of God is the solution to whatever it is we could be going through at this time. Whatever it is you went through yesterday, whatever it is you're going to go through tomorrow, the word of God is your solution. And that's what, uh, that's what Hezekiah did. Hezekiah said, Lord, you know don't you forget, remember, Lord, I've walked before you in truth. Put God in remembrance. God, you said you got prosperity for those that walk in truth. God says you'll move mountains for those that walk in truth. God, I've walked that walk. You can look at my testimony. That's why I tell you, you can't tell God that if you don't have a good testimony. You can't tell God that if you know your walk has been crooked. You know your walk has been false and not truthful. And notice, once again, he has isolated everyone. Isaiah has left the room. This is Hezekiah with his face to the wall talking to who? God. Yeah, that's not the time to try to perform. That's not the time to try to lie. God knows whether you're telling the truth or not. That's the time to be real. And if you have truly sold for the Lord, God will remember you. God will remember you. He said, Lord, you know my walk has been truthful. Watch it. He said, you know my heart has been loyal. He said, Lord, you know my behavior has been after the ways of righteousness. He said, Lord, I've tried my best. I've tried my best to be the best. I've tried my best to do what you've asked me to do. I've stayed away from the very appearance of evil. He began to just put God in remembrance of his word. Because all throughout the word of God, that's what it says. Blessed is he that walketh not, standeth not, sitteth not. Blessed is he that is poor in spirit. Blessed is he that hungers and thirsts. Blessed is he that mourns. Blessed, blessed. All throughout the scripture, it tells us that if we live a life for God, we will be blessed. And that's what Hezekiah did. He said, Lord, I've done the best that I could. You know whether or not I'm telling you the truth. I've tried. And God was pleased. Let me give you this last lesson, guys. If you're going to live in the face of bad news, lesson four, you need to learn how to submit your life to God's will. So what was left for Hezekiah to do? He had already turned his face towards the wall. He had already started this conversation with Almighty God. He had already begun to put God in remembrance of his walk, his heart, and his behavior. The text says, won't nothing left to do but to submit. How do you know, Pastor? It doesn't say he submitted. But look at what it does say at the end of verse 3. It says, and he wept bitterly. He wept. That lets me know he released, guys. That lets me know he just accepted. Well, what did he accept? He accepted that God was bigger than he was. He accepted that he was just a small pawn in the hand of Almighty God. I get tired of people always acting like they're so big and they're so much bigger than God. No, we're small pawns in the hands of God. And he just sat there and cried. In other words, he says, God, my life is in your hands. See, that's poor in spirit. If you didn't know what that phraseology meant, that's poor in spirit. Notice it right after that, it says, bless are those that mourn. He sat there and cried. 
He literally said, Father, stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. If you withdraw thyself from me, Father, should I go? He laid himself down upon God's mercy, and he just wept. He just cried. He just prepared himself because he had did all that he could do. Yeah, he didn't call nobody. He didn't try to go get no psychic reading. He didn't try to proposition nobody. He didn't try to do anything except he turned his face to the wall. He talked to God. He put God in remembrance of who he was. And then he just sat there and cried. Amen. Guys, you got to sometimes just sit there. God, I've done all I could do. That's Jesus right there, guys. Jesus was in the garden. And as he was making his way, he said, Lord, if it be your will, let this cup pass. That's what, that's what Hezekiah was doing. And then he said, but it's not my will, but it's your will. And he accepted what God had for him. You see, so many times we don't accept what God has for us. Now, don't get it wrong. You have to deal with it, but you don't want to accept it. My catch is, my, my, my psyche is, if I got to deal with it, I might as well accept it. You got to deal with they left, so why don't you accept it? You got to deal with they did, so why don't you accept it? You got to deal with you've been fired, you can't show up on that job no more. Why don't you just accept it? You got to deal with that the name of the team is not Redskins any longer. It's Commanders. You don't like it, but why don't you just go ahead and accept it? Because you look ignorant still calling them by a name that's not even something that they go by any longer. See, so often, guys, we, we want to just, we just deal with stuff with our lips poked out. When I say deal, I'm talking about this is your lip poked out. You don't really want to, but you don't have a choice. But when I say accept, it means you accept that this is what life has brought you and you must find a way to keep on living. Yeah, there's some, there's some life that's in us. I had to live after my father died. I have to live after others die. I have to live even when I get the news that some folks just don't care for me. I can accept that. And I can move on. And that's what Hezekiah was doing. He did his part, and then he just cried. The Bible doesn't say nothing else he did. He cried and said, God, I accept whatever it is that you have to give to me. If you're going to cause me to die, Lord, I accept it. And it was at that moment, the Bible says in verse 4, listen to what it says in the King James. It just says, and it happened. I love it. And it happened. See, see, I, I'm going to keep on acting and responding in the face of bad news in a certain way because I know it's going to happen. I know God is going to show up on my behalf. It says before Isaiah got into the middle of the courtyard, God spoke to him and told him to go back. It was at that moment that Isaiah told Hezekiah, whatever you did, it was enough to change God's mind. God is going to give you 15 more years on your life. Why? Because he knew how to respond. Beulah Nation, I pray you learn how to respond in the face of bad news. Go and get you a drink when you know alcohol don't do you well. It's not how you respond. Using drugs, whether it's prescription or illegal, that's not how you respond. Hitting the panic button, talking about quitting everything, leaving everywhere, stopping going, stop going to church. That's not how you respond. Lord knows, talking about committing suicide, that's not how you respond. That's a weak person's way out. How you respond is do what Hezekiah did. You turn your face towards the wall. I can imagine he got on his knees. And he began to talk to God. And he made a plea to God. He, God says, reason with me. Let us reason together. And he began to put God in remembrance of who he had tried to be. And then he said, God, whatever it is for my life, it is well, 
it is well. It is well with my soul. Do you know what that phraseology means? It means, God, whatever you have, I'll be satisfied. And it's at that moment, God says, that's all I ever wanted for my child. He said, I don't mind giving you 15 more years. To somebody else, he said, I don't mind giving you 20 years. To somebody else, I don't mind giving you three more years. I just like a child of God to be satisfied with what's in my hand. There's a song that says, what God has for me, it is for me. And the sooner you accept that, oh my gracious. There's another song that says, God has spoken. Let the church say, put your name there. Take out church. God has spoken. God just waits for you to say amen. And when God says, oh, you willing to deal and accept that? Yes, I am, Lord. If that's what you have for my life, I've pled to you. I've given you my heart. But whatever you have for my life, I'll be satisfied. Matter of fact, Grandma used to sing a song sound like that. You remember what she used to say? Any way you bless me, I'll be satisfied. And when you become a satisfied, non-complaining child of God, God begins to open up windows and doors and he blesses you like I don't know what. But if everything about your happiness and your joy is contingent upon what you have and what's going your way and if life seems fair to you, God can't work with that. God needs you to be sold out to him. Amen? Hallelujah. Beulah Nation, I pray I've said something to bless you on today. I pray I've said something to encourage you to run on and see what the end shall be. If I have, why don't you call us? Why don't you text us, email us in the name of Jesus? We would love to hear from you. You do not have to live this life alone. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel, why don't you subscribe? Make sure you ring the bell. So every time we go live, you'll be notified. Likewise, if you're watching us on Facebook, follow our page. Like our page. Like this broadcast. And most importantly, share this broadcast. So others would know how to live in the face of bad news. Beulah Nation, God has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness whether you have much whether you have little you have what you need to survive because God is on your side if I've said something to bless you why don't you consider sowing a seed into this church there are several ways to give and we pray that you will give Beulah is fertile ground every seed you sow will bring a harvest Hallelujah. Until next time, know that I love you and I praise God for you. Take care. Peace.